Welcome, Mimi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. All right. So my name is Mimi Nguyen. I'm uh, an associate out of Fisher and Phillips Irvine office. Um, like I said earlier, I do a ton of employee handbooks. About half of my practice is advice and counsel. So I draft handbooks and policies and I help employers implement them. Um, so this is Jay. Uh, unfortunately, you are not going to get his sparkling personality today. It's just me. Um, all right, so first, um, I want to just do like a 30,000 foot overview about why handbooks are so important. So the first reason is just think about your audience, right? So it's a great opportunity for you to introduce yourself to your employees. So you tell your employees your history, what's important to you, what they can expect of you, and what you expect of them. So it's a really great way to set the tone. Um, second, you can use the employee handbook to fulfill a lot of your notice obligations. Um, you can avoid technical violations of the law that way. So for example, in California, we have a ton of uh, labor laws where you have to give certain notices to employees and it'd be way too daunting to try to do all of that in separate documents. It's a lot easier to try to do it all within the employee handbook. Um, and then lastly, um, with regard to my job, um, the most important thing is your handbook is going to be the key piece of evidence in any lawsuit that you're going to face. Um, if you ever get sued by a former employee, your attorney is going to ask you first and foremost for your handbook and your policies, because that is what we're going to use as the primary line of defense. Um, and when your policies are compliant, it will be so much easier to defend claims against the company. Uh, policies that are non-compliant, I see a lot of bad ones. Um, it makes it really hard. I have to get very creative with my arguments. Uh, and it drives off, it drives up the cost of litigation for you. So um, one of the things that I like about handbooks too is you can use it in addition to a litigation tool is you can use it very strategically to roll out um, a new arbitration agreement. Um, typically, um, I believe right now everywhere except for California, you can make an arbitration agreement mandatory as a condition of employment. In California, you can't. So for any employers that are in California, I would suggest using rolling out an employee handbook as the perfect time to roll out a new arbitration agreement, because we've seen that when you do that in conjunction with each other, you get a much higher rate of execution. So um, one thing that I want to talk about today's theme is this is just my personal philosophy on employee handbooks. I believe less is more. Um, I see some employee handbooks that are over 100 pages, and it turns into like an operational manu uh, manual. You're trying to include every single thing that anyone who ever works for the company would ever need to know about it. And that's not the purpose of the handbook. So what a handbook should be is a summary of the rules that govern employment with the company that apply to everyone. If there's only certain policies that apply to certain categories, employees pull that out and provide it as a separate standalone document. And also keep in mind that um, the employee handbook is not intended to cover every possible scenario. It's only intended to include important information without over-educating your employees. Um, all right, so next. All right, so in today's discussion, I'm gonna highlight some recent statutory and case law updates that's gonna affect how you're gonna have to draft your handbooks going forward and how you're gonna have to administer them. Um, I am a California attorney, so my focus is going to be heavily on California updates, but I will talk about other states and federal updates as well. Um, so typically, um, organization is key in an employee handbook. It's going to make it easier for your employees to find what they want to find, for you to update the handbook when you need to, and for me <laughs> to find the policies that are important when I need to. So there's typically nine sections that I divide an employee handbook into. Uh, it's going to start with your introduction and then what you can expect from us, timekeeping and payroll practices, company benefits, leave of absences, employee conduct, procedures and guidelines, information technology, changes in status, and then arbitration agreement is not included because it should be provided as a separate standalone document. All right, so another big picture organization um, thing I want to talk about is you need to be cognizant of where the company is operating. If you're only operating in one state, it makes sense just to have one handbook for that state. But a lot of employers now operate in multiple states. And when that happens, what I like to do is include one federal employee handbook 
and that's going to cover federal law and every policy that applies to everyone, no matter where, what state or city you're working in. And then in addition to that, what you want is either a state or local agenda that addresses only those policies that apply to the employees working in those areas. So I'll give you an example here of what I mean by that. So for example, let's say in the handbook, you're going to have an equal employment opportunity policy, and you're going to list all of the protected categories under federal law. What you would then, what you would then do in the state agenda is, for example, let's say you're working in Tennessee, you would have a, another EEO policy, and within the Tennessee addendum, you add all the protected categories under only Tennessee law. And the reason I like doing it this way is twofold. First, you don't want, it's a, an, an optics thing, you don't want employees in one state to see how much more or less they're getting than employees in another state. Um, it's just, it, it causes a lot less employee morale issues that way. And the second is it makes it a lot easier to update your employee handbooks going forward. So there are some states like California that you're gonna have to update your employee handbook documents probably every year because just our legislature is so busy. And there are other states like, um, I don't know, Alabama, where you might only have to update once every two years, if that. So by organizing the handbook that way, you just you can keep costs down and you can stay, it's much easier to streamline your compliance going forward. All right, so in the first section of the handbook, the introduction, typically this is where you're gonna include something like a welcome statement, you know, welcoming your employees, introducing um, company history, things like that. Um, you could also include um, a policy um, indicating who the chain of command is. So if they have questions about the handbook, who should they talk to first? For example, their supervisor, and if not the supervisor, perhaps the human resources manager, and if not them, then um, maybe a C-suite executive. And sometimes I also see employers include a code of conduct, um, just like a general code of conduct that sort of like summarizes and bullet point all of the policies that the company considers to be most important. Um, there's no real 2023 legislative update that needs to be included into the introduction, uh, introduction section. Um, I just will note that one thing I always keep an eye out for is um, you need to include an at-will statement in the very beginning of the handbook. And by that, what I mean is you need some language that says that employment at the company is at will and is terminable um, by the employee or the company at any time for any reason. Um, what that will do is when employees try to sue for a wrongful termination, we can point to that um, to defend you against such claims. Um, the only thing you need to remember is there are some states um, that will make exceptions to the general at-will employment doctrine and create carve-outs for when employees can't be terminated. And so I would always check state and local law to make sure there's nothing there that's applicable. Sorry. All right. The next section is um, what you can expect from us. And there's usually just five policies I include in this section. And these are the five most important policies. Um, the first is the introductory policy, and that tells your employees when they start to begin earning certain benefits. Um, most employers set it for 60 to 90 days, but you can set it for longer. I've seen as long as six months. Um, the most important thing to remember, this is not a 2023 update, but just been a, around for a while, is that health insurance, if it is offered, the waiting time period cannot be longer than 90 consecutive days. Um, 90 consecutive days is the standard, not three months. So don't conflate that. Um, and then also another thing to remember in the introductory period is you can set different waiting time periods for different classifications of employees. So for example, your full-time employees may get vacation after 90 days, but your part-time employees might have to wait for six months. That's perfectly fine. Um, what you also need to include is an equal employment opportunity policy, and that lists out the protected categories under federal and state law. There's also a reasonable accommodation policy um, that typically references you know, religious observances and disability and tells employees who to contact if they need to request a um, accommodation. And then these two policies are related. Um, it's the policy against unlawful harassment, discrimination, and retaliation, and the reporting policy for the same. Um, just remember that whatever protected categories you include in the EEO policy, you're going to want to repeat in these two policies. 
Okay. So for 2023, what you need to do is you need to check the protected categories in your EEO policy and your policy against unlawful harassment, and you need to update them with any additional protected categories. Um, for example, uh, in California, going forward, um, a reproductive health decision making is included as a protected category. Um, I give you an example of you know, an attempt by California to pass another protected category that was not successful, and that's familial responsibilities. So it's very important to stay on track, uh, stay on top of these updates so that you have those protected categories included. Um, I give you some examples from other states, Tennessee, Nevada, and Nebraska, they included Crown Acts, um, which are laws that extend the protected category of race to include hair and protected hairstyles. Um, even some localities like Miami have passed um, a similar law. So it's very important uh, to keep on, on top of uh, developments in this area. All right. So the third section of the employee handbook is typically timekeeping and payable practices. And these are the five categories of policies, buckets that I like to address in this section. So the first is your employee classification. So here you're going to define what the company considers full-time versus part-time versus temporary. And um, you have a lot of discretion here to determine what that what you consider a full-time, part-time, temporary employee to be. Um, the only thing I will note is that for temporary employees, I always like to include language that um, and a, a temporary employee does not lose their at-will status if their work assignment is extended. The reason I like to do that is um, I've seen plaintiff's counsel try to argue that by virtue of extending a work assignment, that employee has somehow been converted from temporary who has much less protections to a part-time or full-time employee. With regard to 2023 updates, what you want to focus on is exempt versus non-exempt employee. So within the handbook itself, I usually keep a very short, brief description of what is exempt versus non-exempt. An uh, exempt employee is someone who is exempt from federal and state overtime laws. And a non-exempt employee, the opposite is true. So with regard to this, how you draft the handbook will not change that much, but how you administer it will change. Because what you need to do is check state and local laws re regarding applicable exempt employee thresholds. So um, under federal law, to be an exempt employee, you have to make a certain amount of money and you have to do certain things, right? Uh, some states um, tack on additional requirements to that. So um, for example, in California, not only do you have to meet an income threshold, but you have to pass a job duties test. And that test is more than 50% of employees' time is engaged in exempt duties. Um, so states like you know, California, Colorado, and Washington have raised the applicable salary thresholds, um, while other states have returned to the federal standard. So you're going to want to check uh, where the company is operating and see what's applicable to you and your employees. Um, another thing that um, I always check for in this exempt versus non-exempt definition is don't misuse terms like salary to conflate them with exempt. Just because an employee is receiving a salary does not automatically make them exempt. All right. So the next bucket of information I include in this third section of employee handbooks is it concerns uh, an employee's pay. And uh, the topics that you're gonna wanna cover is when will the paycheck be distributed? Um, regular pay versus overtime versus commission. Um, there's going to be applicable state and legal laws depend regarding how these payments are made. So uh, as an example, in California, you can, there's a very strict set schedule as to when you can plan an employee there's uh, regular pay. And there are also laws that dictate that overtime pay can trail the regular pay period by one pay cycle and commissions are controlled by commission agreements. So when drafting the employee handbook, consider how you're paying your employees and what laws apply. Um, you can keep this section pretty general and just say something like, oh, mm, paychecks will be distributed on the 1st and 15th of each month, something like that. But if you have very um, complicated pay schedules, you might want to flesh that a little bit more and just make sure you're compliant with the applicable laws. 
Um, also remember that um, you need to consider how paychecks will be issued, whether it'll be a live check or a direct deposit or a pay card. So um, federal law allows employers to require employees to accept payment via direct deposit, um, as long as you don't require employees to open an account at a specific bank to do so, and as long as you allow other options for receiving payment, for example, a live check. But that changes under certain state laws, and some states require a, um, a written mandatory, um, no, I'm sorry, a written disclosure to require direct deposit, and there are other states where you don't need any prior authorization. So for example, Alabama, North Carolina, Indiana, you have to have a written pre-authorization. But if you're operating in Alaska or Colorado, you don't. I'm sorry, I have that in backwards. So if you're in Colorado or California or Connecticut, you do need prior authorization. If you're in Alabama, North Carolina, or Indiana, you don't. And also with regard to pay cards, just be very careful if you're using this as a way to pay employees. There are a lot of very strict laws about how you can use a pay card to pay employees. Most of those laws govern whether or not you can take fees out for each time an employee will use that card. Um, and then the last thing you want to um, think about in this section is what types of information must be disclosed in an employee's paycheck. So in California, we have a law that dictates nine categories of information that must be included on every wage statement. Um, this is not something you need to explicitly include in the employee handbook and list it out, but you do need to be aware of them. So um, the point of me saying that is the employee handbook dictates your policy. You need to make sure that every step of the way, your practice aligns with the policy. Okay. So um, with regard to pay, there are a couple of things you might want to keep in mind. Um, one is the minimum wage increase. So um, every year, usually on January 1st, several states and cities are going to increase their minimum wage requirements. Um, so this can be pretty complicated to follow. Um, for example, some states implement annual increases that account for, inflation, uh, for, account for inflation that are based on the consumer price index. Um, other states are focused on reaching a certain threshold. For example, in New York, the minimum wage law is focused on reaching a $15 minimum threshold. Um, other states like Minnesota, Minnesota um, apply certain minimum wage increases based on employees' revenue, while states like Nevada, the base minimum wage increases on whether an employee offers qualifying health benefits. So you need to know, um, reg regardless of where you're operating, how those minimum wage increases are going to affect you. You do not need to um, provide a disclosure of what the minimum wage is. It's just uh, something for like operational purposes. Something that is um, very important um, for this year, especially in California, is there's a couple of new laws that passed regarding pay transparency. And these laws require employers to disclose the pay they offer in jo job postings to applicants and to provide um, pay salaries to employees upon request. So Colorado was the first state, I believe, to pass this uh, type of law in 2021. And so since then, California and Washington have followed suit. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of other states do the same. Um, California and Washington's law takes effect January 1st, 2023. Um, I've, I've, I've fielded some questions already from certain employers whether or not they can provide this information via the handbook. I wouldn't. Um, and you don't have to include any sort of disclosure in the handbook either that you're going to comply with this law. Just know that it exists. All right. The next category of information is you need to define the work week. This is very important. And make sure you know the difference between a work week and your business hours. So you might be open from Monday to Friday, nine to five. But what I mean by defining the work week is you need to encompass the full seven days because that is how we're going to determine when overtime, benef uh, overtime rules will apply. Um, I like to keep this information separate and apart somewhere in the handbook, like bolded even, because it's uh, very important. You don't want to bury it anywhere. 
Um, there's no real 2023 updates that you need to do for this section. You might want to stay on top of some legislation um, that you know may require a four-day work week. I'll give you an example. California, there is AB 2932. Um, it ultimately failed. It did not pass, but it would have required um, a work week of 32 hours, and anything beyond that would have been compensated at 1.5 times the regular rate. All right. So um, timekeeping procedures. Here, you're going to notify employees how they're going to be expected to keep track of their time, whether it be a handwritten time record, you're going to use some sort of electronic timekeeping application, or now I see a lot of employees use like a biometric application with a fingerprint or a face scan. Um, no real 2023 20, updates that need to be included in the handbook in this section in terms of language, but in terms of administration, there's a couple of things that you need to keep in mind of. The first is reimbursement. So if your employee is expected to keep an app on their phone or some other sort of mobile device where they're going to clock in and out to track their time, you may be obligated to reimburse them for using some of that data. So in California, we have Labor Code 28. O2. And it requires that if you have an employee um, download an app, you have to reimburse them for a reasonable rate of use of their data. Um, and that reasonableness standard in California, like typically I'll see reimbursement, like phone stipends, anywhere from like 10 to maybe $40. It really depends on how much your employee is using your phone. So if they're using their phone just to track their time, 10 bucks will probably do it. Uh, if they're a sales employee and they're constantly on their phone, you might want to like move that needle up more towards $40 end. Um, that's just California. Um, other states, I believe Illinois is one, also has reimbursement obligations. You're going to want to stay on top of that and make sure that um, not only do you have a reimbursement disclosure or policy in the handbook telling employees that you're going to reimburse for use of their um, cell phone, but make sure that your practice aligns with what is required of you. Another issue um, in particular with regard to biometric applications is um, if you're gonna be using timekeeping applications that use biometric data for employees to clock in and out, there may be privacy laws that um, may be implicated. So in California, we have the CCPA, which requires if you're gonna use biometric application, if you're gonna be storing it, tracking an employee, even just to uh, track time, you need to give them a, a written disclosure that you're going to be doing that. And I believe Illinois' uh, BIPA requires the same. So things to keep in mind. All right, the next section is meal rest and recovery. So not every state, um, but at this point, I think about a third of all states have some sort of meal and or rest law in place that requires employees to give employees a certain amount of time in the the work shift to take a break. Um, so federal law, there's no such requirement, but do check your state and local laws. For states that have um, such laws, you want to make sure that your policy is very well written and tracks the law. Um, here in California, meal and rest period claims are almost always tacked onto any sort of wage and hour claim. Uh, it's heavily litigated. So this is one of the areas in employee handbook where I scrutinize it very closely. And almost always, uh, if I see a, a policy that is even a little bit off, um, I always recommend that you take our, our recommended language instead of having me try to tweak yours. Because um, our language has been vetted for litigation and I believe in it. So um, some things to... Keep in mind if you're going to be reviewing your meal rest recovery period policies is keep track of how much time that you have to give them. So in California, you have to give them at least 30 minutes. That's unpaid. Um, if it's a rest break, it's at least 10 minutes, but that's paid. Um, recovery is, it, it doesn't really say how much, but like minimum of five minutes. Um, you also want to pay attention to whether or not the meal rest period um, recovery periods are paid or unpaid. Um, some states require only unpaid, some states, California, meal is unpaid, rest is paid. Um, you also want to look, at, look into when the meal rest or recovery periods can be waived. Um, if there are rules requiring waiver, they're usually very technical. Um, 
For example, in California, you can only waive your first meal period break um, if you've worked less than six hours. And you can only waive your second meal period break uh, if you work less than, I think it's 12 hours and you took your first one. So you, whatever the waiver rules are, include them in the employee handbook. And then also include language regarding premium payment. Not every state is gonna require payment of a premium for a missed meal or rest break. Uh, in California, we do. And one thing I think I see too often is employers either don't have that premium language, um, in which case it leaves you susceptible to a wage and hour class action because um, they're gonna say that you never gave them um, notice of this of a payment obligation. And also um, what I see second um, is you include, a lot of employers will only include one premium payment policy and that's not actually what the law requires. You need to have two separate premium notices, one for the meal, one for the rest. You should have one for the recovery too. All right. So this is an important 2023 case law update. Um, it doesn't really affect how the employee handbook has to be drafted directly, but it is something you need to keep in mind when administering the handbook policy. So um, there was a case that was just decided last year, Naranja versus Spectrum Security Services. And there, the California Supreme Court held that meal premiums are wages rather than penalties. And this is important because in California, we have this waiting time penalty law. And basically, it punishes um, employers if you do not pay employees all wages owed within a certain time frame after either resignation or termination. termination. And it could be pretty steep. It's 30 days daily wages. So prior to this case, um, we could take the position that even if an employee was owed a meal or rest premium, they were not considered wages and thereby, and therefore the 226 waiting time penalty law was not triggered. Um, we can no longer make that argument. And so that's why you have to be really cognizant that your practice is aligned with your policy and employee handbook. All right, the next section is company benefits. Um, you can include anything here, insurance policies, um, discretionary policy uh, benefits that you provide to employees, but today I'm just gonna talk about three, paid vacation, vacation PTO, and paid sick leave. With regard to paid um, holiday policy, so federal law does not require providing paid holidays, but you should check state and local laws because sometimes they do. So for example, in Massachusetts, um, it used to be the case that um, retail employers um, had to pay their employees a premium pay if their employees worked on Sundays or holidays. Um, starting January 1st, 2023, that's no longer required. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. So if you're an employer working in Massachusetts, check your policies. If you have, if, if you have a policy in there that concerns this premium payment, um, you can get rid of it or revise it as needed. Um, for Rhode Island, um, the opposite is true. So beginning in 2023, um, Rhode Island will become the only state left that requires non-exempt employees to be paid a premium rate for working on Sundays or holidays. So sorry for Rhode Island employers. Um, when drafting a holiday, a paid holiday policy, there's really three things that I focus on. Uh, the first issue is you need to specify who will get the paid holiday. Is it full-time? part-time, temporary, everybody, no one. And then second, you need to notify employees what they will get paid if they're asked to work on a holiday. So for example, a non-exempt employee asked to work on a holiday might get just their regular rate, or they might get one and a half times the regular rate um, in addition to holiday pay, or they only get paid for the hours that they worked. Um, and then lastly, you need to... Um, decide whether or not paid holiday pay will be factored into whether or not employee has worked overtime. Typically, the answer is no. You're not going to want to add that in there. All right. So next, for vacation and PTO policies, um, you will want to check if there are any state or local laws that require payout of vacation upon separation. If, you, if you're working in a state or a city that does require that, I would definitely include at least a sentence in the handbook saying that you will pay that out. Um, 
You also check if there's been any updates. So I'll give you an example. So in Maine, um, starting January 1st, 2023, um, the state revised its vacation law statute to require that all unused paid vacation accrued pursuant to the employee's vacation policy on and after January 1st, 2023 must be paid to the employee on cessation of employment. Um, and this law applies to employers with 11 or more employees. So if you're working in Maine, this is something to be aware of. Uh, the second thing I would think about for 2023 going forward is if you are an employer that is currently implementing a combined PTO policy. And what I mean by that is um, instead of providing vacation and paid sick leave separately, some employers choose to lump those two benefits into one, what is under what is known as a PTO policy, paid time off. Um, if you're going to do something like that, you still need to um, track how much time is being taken as paid sick leave versus vacation. And I think it's uh, it's not a legal requirement, but it's a best practice to do that because um, in some states, California is one, what, what you pay an employee for each type of leave will differ. So in California, if, a, if an employee is taking vacation under a PTO policy, you can pay them just their base hourly rate. But if the employee is taking paid sick leave, and even if it falls under a PTO policy, you need to pay them their regular rate. And the difference between an hourly rate and a regular rate is important when it comes to employees that receive incentive pay. If you have an employee that's receiving commission, um, you need to factor their commission into their regular rate. So you can have a, a commission employee that might make $15 an hour in one period, and then because of a large commission, might make $25 an hour um, in another pay period. So um, do keep track of that. All right. So next, for paid sick leave, um, you're going to want to check state and local laws to see if your paid sick leave policy needs to be updated. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So in California, all of my California employees, I've been telling them to update their paid sick leave policy to include a designated person as a category of person who employees may use paid sick leave to care for. Um, this is important. Um, you have to provide this notice and you need to define who a designated person is. Uh, similarly, in Illinois, um, a law was recently passed, I think it's effective January 1st, 2023, um, that states that the rights afforded under the state's paid sick leave law serves as the minimum standard in a negotiated collective bargaining agreement. So if you have union employees, this is something to be aware of. And also um, COVID-19. I get a lot of questions about COVID-19 policies, whether they should be included in the handbook and whatnot. I'm of the opinion they should not. Um, COVID-19 regulations are usually ever-changing and you don't wanna throw that into an employee handbook because then every time it changes, you have to update the entire handbook and that's a hassle. It's much better to include them as separate standalone documents. Uh, and that way, if anything changes, it's much quicker to update and issue out new policies as needed. Um, if you're working in a jurisdiction where um, there have been previously passed COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave laws, I would check and see if those laws have been extended. And if so, update your COVID-19 policies. The next area of the handbook is leaves of absences. Uh, and most handbooks will have these like broad categories of leave, you know, civic duties, which is typically uh, jury duty, voting leave, there'll be military leave crime victims leave, sometimes uh, states will have like leave for domestic violence victims. Um, there's also school related leaves. Um, so a lot of states, California is one of them, will have leaves for parents that need to attend uh, meetings with their children's school teachers or uh, things like that. So there is also medical leave and discretionary leave. So these two types of leaves are what I will discuss in greater detail today because uh, typically, what I've seen for 2023 is those are the two types of leave that will require the most updating. So for medical leave, um, it, it would just take forever to try to run down every type of medical leave that's new or needs to be revised in all 50 states. So I just give you an example of two. So um, for Colorado, there's the paid family medical leave. Uh, effective January 1st, 2023, it provides up to 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave with an additional four weeks for pregnancy or childbirth complications. Um, employees can't take this type of leave until 2024, but premiums are due under the program starting January 1st, 2023. So this is a brand new law, 
And so for employees working in Colorado, you will need to add this to your um, existing handbook documents. Uh, similarly, in Illinois, um, SB 3120 was recently passed. This is also effective January 1st, 2023. And what this law does is it requires employee to provide unpaid leave for absences resulting from pregnancy loss, unsuccessful IVF treatment, a failed adoption or surrogacy, or a diagnosis that impacts pregnancy. So um, just, just examples of things you need to be aware of, because as new laws are passed, you need to have policies that are compliant included in your handbook policies. With regard to, um, this is a, an example of discretionary leave. So it used to be in California that discretionary leave was, or bereavement leave was completely up to the employer. You could provide it if you want to, you didn't have to, if you didn't want to, it could be paid, unpaid, it was completely up to the employer. Um, a law was recently passed, AB 1949, which now mandates that employers provide at least five days of bereavement leave. You still have the option of providing as it paid or unpaid, but it must be provided. Um, the law also augments CIFRA, which is California's state equivalent of FMLA, uh, to include that um, they can use, uh, employees can use bereavement leave uh, under CIFRA. And it also expands the CIFRA definition of family member. So just laws like this, um, I, if you're updating your employee handbook, stay on top of it, add it to the handbook. Next section is employee conduct. So this is the part of the employee handbook where you have a lot of discretion about what you wanna include or not include and what type of language you want to craft. Um, these are examples of the type of policies typically included in this section. Um, the policies highlighted in red are the ones I'm gonna talk about because they should be revisited for 2023. So the first one is the alcohol and drug policy. So marijuana is still illegal under federal law, but you should check state and local law to determine if marijuana use is a protected category. Now, a lot of states have passed laws that now consider um, employee status as a cannabis user or like a cannabis medical card holder as protected category. If that's the case, you should update your EEO policy to include that. And you should consider revising your alcohol and drug policy um, accordingly as well. So um, I'll give you two examples. So in DC, um, B109 now prohibits testing for marijuana as a condition of employment under certain circumstances. If you are an employer that was previously across the board doing um, drug testing pre-employment, you're gonna have to revisit your policy and your practice. Uh, another example is California. So AB 2188. So this law was signed by Governor Newsom on September 18th, 2022, but it doesn't become operative until January 1st, 2024. So you have a little bit of time before you have to comply. And basically what AB 2188 does is it prohibits employers from discriminating employees based on one, an employee's use of cannabis off the job and away from the workplace, and two, drug screening at tests that found the person to have non-psychoactive cannabis metabolites in their hair, blood, urine, or other bodily fluids. Um, there are some exceptions to AB 28, 2188's new rules, so it doesn't apply to employees in the building construction trade, and it doesn't apply to employees in position requiring federal government background checks. Um, so knowing the exceptions are important because if you're an employer that wants to continue um, testing for these type of things, um, you can do so if you fall within an exception. Um, one of the questions, most commonly asked questions about AB 2188 is whether or not an employer can still discipline an employee who shows up to work high, and you can. Um, the problem is the statute doesn't define impairment in terms of an employee who shows up to work impaired. So we're anticipating a lot of litigation in the future about that. So you still can discipline an employee for showing up high to work, but um, you might want to be careful about it. Okay, and then something else to remember is I only give you two examples here, but there are a bunch of other states that have passed similar laws that protect employees who smoke marijuana recreationally outside the workplace. Some examples are Connecticut, Montana, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island. All right. And then the other policy that should be revisited for 2023 is your personal dress and appearance policy. Um, the first thing is uh, you should definitely include language that the policy will not be enforced in violation of any federal, state, or local equal employment laws. If you are, if you don't already have that language in the handbook, you should definitely add it for 2023. Um, 
I would also remove any gender specific um, requirements regarding who can wear what to work. And then the next policy in this section that you should probably consider revisiting is your workplace violence policy. So a lot of states have passed legislation that sets forth the conditions under which employees may keep a firearm and ammunition in their personal vehicles in the employer's parking lot. So I think a couple of years ago, what I saw a lot of was uh, workplace violence policies that um, just across the board pro prohibited employees from bringing any sort of firearm onto company premises, including the parking lot. Um, if you are currently working in a state with a law like this that has passed, you need to revisit your workplace violence policy and tweak the language to create exceptions to when an employee can bring their firearm um, to work, or at least the parking area. Um, all right. The next section is procedures and guidelines. So typically in this um, section, there will be policies like, you know, if you have company vehicles that employees will be driving, you'll have a policy like that. Uh, sometimes there'll be discussed, uh, discussions of mileage reimbursement, um, policies regarding like meetings and trainings and personnel records, how an employee can request a copy of them. So for 2023, the only real, um, update you need to add is going to be for mileage reimbursement. And that's because the IRS has increased its mileage reimbursement rate. Um, it used to be 58.5 cents per mile, and it's going to be 62.5 cents now. Um, and that rate increase, I believe, went into effect July 1st, 2022. So you should already be in compliance. So I also talk about this. This is specific only to California, but I want to use it as an example. So in California, um, SB 1044 was recently passed. And what this law does is it makes it unlawful for an employer to take adverse action against an employee where the employer refuses to work because the employee feels safe. So it's aimed at like states of emergency or emergency conditions, but the language is very, very broad. It has, it's brand new, so it hasn't been litigated yet. But um, for California employee, employers, I have been recommending that this a policy that addresses this law be included in the employee handbook. Um, the reason is, uh, not only is it signed into law, but it's so ambiguous that you want to have some sort of policy in place, at least, so that if there is litigation that follows, at least you have something um, that shows compliance, at least on its, your face. Um, something else is, California is normally trendsetter when it comes to certain laws. And this is one of the um, laws that's a bit unique to California, and I would not be surprised if other states quickly followed suit. All right, so the next section is gonna be information technology. And normally in this section, you're gonna discuss you know, trade secrets, confidential information policy, perhaps an acceptable use policy for company IT, a social media policy, things of that nature. For 2023, there's two things that I typically have been keeping an eye out for. And the first is if you're an employer that's gonna be using AI um, to make employment decisions, um, just be aware that there are a couple of laws floating out there that like, for example, in, in New York City, um, there's, a, there's a law that passed that requires an employer that uses an automated employment decision tool to screen a candidate for an employment decision to notify each candidate regarding use of the AI tool. So you have to disclose to employees that you're gonna be doing this. Um, you may not want to include it in the handbook. It depends on how your company operates. If employees are only gonna get the employee handbook after they're hired, it might be too late to give them this disclosure. Um, so this might be something that you should consider adding to the handbook or maybe as a standalone document, depending on how you um, how the company operates. The other thing that you should be aware of is there's um, some laws that limit an employer's ability to track employees via, via GPS tracking. So I see this a lot for um, employers that um, have um, employees that drive around all day, sales employees, things like that. So on their phone or in the car, there's gonna be some sort of device that tracks where the employee is. You just wanna keep the employee honest that they're there where they actually say they are. But if you're gonna be doing that, effective January 1st, 2023, um, you have to provide written disclosure regarding use of the GPS tracking technology um, 
And then you also have to allow an employee to disable off hours when they're not going to get tracked. Um, you can include that disclosure in the handbook or as a separate standalone document. So something to consider for 2023. Um, the last section of the employee handbook is changes in status. Um, this is usually just the closing to the employee handbook and I'll include policy, policies like um, outside inquiries regarding employees. Like if the employee quits and they want a reference, who do they talk to? What types of information will you disclose? Um, you could also have a notice of resignation, not required, but a lot of employers like to include in there that we want like two weeks notice before you quit or something like that. And like also there might be a policy regarding an exit interview, uh, just telling employees that if you quit, you know, we might sit down and ask you like, why did you quit? What's wrong? Things like that. Um, with regard to a potential update that you might want to consider in the handbook for 2023, depending on where you're operating is there are final pay obligations. So for example, in California, if an employee quits, you have to provide all of their final wages within 72 hours. If you terminate them, you have to provide it the same day. So for something like that, um, no matter where you're working, I would try to figure out what those final pay obligations are and just stay in compliance. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the last piece. This is not actually go in the handbook, but um, for me, this is probably the best reason to consider updating your handbook for 2023. So um, you might've heard of a case called Viking, Viking River Cruises. It was just decided a couple of months ago by the Supreme Court of the United States. And the most important thing about this case is four states that have representative actions. So in California, we have something called the Private Attorney General's Act. And what that does is it allows employees to basically step into the shoes of the labor commissioner and sue on the behalf of uh, the state, right? And uh, any penalties that are awarded are divided between the state and the employee. The employee gets 25%, the state gets 75%. The problem with that is um, it used to be the case in California that PAGA claims were not compelled to arbitration. Like uh, the California's rationale was that through state sovereignty, you can't compel a state to arbitration. And if an employee is stepping into the shoes of the labor commissioner, they're in essence acting on the state's behalf, so you can't do that. Uh, what's a great win for employers is Viking River Cruises basically says, well, you can't, because you're going to, uh, what, the, what the Supreme Court said was it divided PAGA claims into individual claims, claims on behalf of the named employee who's suing on behalf of the state, and claims that are representative in nature, all of the other unnamed employees that that employee is suing on behalf of. And when you separate it that way, all the individual claims can be compelled, in compelled to arbitration, and then the representative claims remain. And since there's now no longer a representative for this representative action, typically what happens is courts will dismiss, or they should dismiss the case. So because Viking River Cruises is such a huge win for employers, I've been advising everybody, this is a great time. Update your handbook, get out a brand new arbitration agreement that has this PAGA language in there so that for as long as this law is good, you can compel um, employees to arbitration for PAGA claims. And what happens most of the time is when you compel a PAGA claim to uh, arbitration, the value of the claim diminishes drastically. And sometimes plaintiff stories, you know, they abandon it completely. They're much more motivated to, um, to settle. All right. Uh, the only other thing about arbitration agreements that um, you should be aware of, and this is a federal law, and you should definitely update your arbitration agreements to comply, is you can no longer compel arbitration for disputes involving sexual harassment or sexual assault. So review your arbitration agreements. And if you have language in there that says that, you know, so and such and such claims are compelled to arbitration and includes sexual harassment or sexual assault, you do need to change that going forward. Okay, so the key takeaways from today is um, when you're drafting the employee handbook, just keep in mind what you want to include and exclude. Um, be mindful and intentional about it and think about industry-specific policies and state-specific policies. Um, in terms of organization, um, think about where you're operating. In one state, several states, um, do you want everything in one document, you know, the handbook document, and then the state agenda, and then any standalone policies or anything like that. And then administration, just be very um, careful that whatever is written in the employee handbook is actually reflecting your, your practices. You don't want your employee handbook to, you know, state all the right things. And then in practice, you're not following any of that. Uh, and one of the most 
important things to make sure that your practices align with your policies is train your employees. Um, my personal recommendation is you need to update your handbook at least every other year. Um, if you're in states that are more with more active lawmaking bodies like California, New York, Massachusetts, Washington, I'd say maybe every year. So what we can do for you um, is if you're in need of an employee handbook, um, typically how I do it, there's, there's two ways. Uh, there's a, a template employee handbook that I could draft for you um, and includes all of the required policies and I'll work with you on what to include, what you can't include. Um, or if you wanna keep your current employee handbook, you can send it to me and I can do a complimentary review and just tell you what's missing, what you should update and I'll give you your pricing uh, and your options. Um, we could also conduct um, a wage and hour audit for you. So if you're unsure whether or not you're, you're properly classifying employees as exempt or not exempt, I can help you with that. Um, all right, and then uh, this is the scary bit. So what's the cost of doing nothing? So if you don't do anything, you don't update your handbook, you don't even have a handbook, um, you're, you're losing out on an important opportunity to set the tone for your company culture, right? And then also if you have out of date or non-compliant policies, you're leaving yourself open to litigation. Uh, especially class action, um, uh, which is very expensive, and you definitely won't want to deal with that. All right, so that is the end of my presentation. I think we have some time left for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Mimi. That was really um, that was really helpful information. I know I learned a lot, and I didn't know that you guys did complimentary um, employee handbook audits. So that's really, really good to, to know. Um, I'm going to put in chat everybody her information again and the credit codes for this webinar. And I will also include um, your contact information in the follow-up email. So, okay, we have a couple of questions. You answered all the questions that were um, submitted ahead of time. So let's just tackle these two questions here. So if you have one remote employee in one state, do you have to follow the state law, that state law, or only the state in which you have the facility? Um, it depends. Depends around hybrid or uh, remote workforce, for sure. So it depends. For wage and hour laws, I generally advise follow the laws in which the, the state that the employee is working. Um, for remote employees, if you only have one, um, most of the time, you, you'd really have to worry about like, EEO uh, equal employment opportunity um, requirements and like paid sick leave, because a lot of those uh, state laws and local laws, there's going to be some sort of employee threshold for applicability. And most of the time it's like five or more, 10 or more. Um, there are very few laws that apply to even just one employee. Hmm. So if you have employees in multiple states around the U.S., you at least need to um post the EOC requirements for, for each of those states. Yeah, so, so whenever I'm working with a, a new client and they're working in multiple states, the first thing I'll ask is give me a, a list of every state, every city where your employees are working and the number of employees. Because based on that, I can give you a recommendation of whether or not you need a state agenda or, you know, or if you have such few employees in certain states that like you could just perhaps revise the employee handbook itself so that it's just compliant to cover all of those states. So it depends. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, this next question says, is the IRS mileage rate mandatory? I thought it was an optional standard. It is not mandatory. It is optional. But I, as a best practice, I say you should reimburse, um, especially if you are operating in a state with mandatory reimbursement rules. Um, California is a great example. You don't reimburse, um, you're, you're at risk for like a unpaid reimbursement claim. And then, you know, you might have, the employee might have only been entitled to like, I don't know, like a hundred bucks of mileage reimbursement, but because of like the attorney's fees and everything that's involved in litigating something like that, now this little claim is worth thousands now. It's not worth the risk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the last one we have here is where is the best place or where is the best site to check if your state has any changes for 2023? There is no one local that, source. <laughs> that, is, that, that is the most frustrating thing. Yeah. Um, I know that that our, um, most people are familiar with what we do. Our state manuals, we have most, we have state, uh, state specific manuals in most states and Fisher Phillips writes a few of those for us. Um, but you can find those on our website and 
almost all of them have been updated for the new year or or most recently um, in the last month or two. So you guys can find those um, materials at hrsimple.com slash solutions or contact Mimi. Can you give them the information again? Sure. Um, my email address is m-n-g-u-y-e-n at fisherphillips.com. And then um, I, I believe I sent you the slides and it has my contact information on it. Yep. So I will be sending this recording as soon as I download it and put it on YouTube and all that stuff and edit it, um, send you the recording and the slides in an email, everybody. So you have those and contact either one of us if you have additional questions. And thank you so much, Mimi, for taking the time to do this. I know it was a little hectic with James not being here and some changes. So we really appreciate your time and this information. This was really great. No, no, a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And happy holidays, everybody. We will see you in January. Bye-bye.